Well, I'd like to begin by thanking Hasib and Mazir for this invitation. I'm excited to be part of the program at RIP and to present you this lecture today, which in an ideal scenario would take place physically in Rotterdam, in proximity to the wind tunnel recently inaugurated at RIP. As already mentioned by Hasib when we first met, he was about to install his solo show titled The Wind Egg at the Mukha, curated by Nav Hack. At the time, I was working towards a PhD in curatorial research as part of a larger research project jointly developed by the Lieben Gewart Center and the Mukha. This research addressed the final unfinished project by the late U.S. artist, activist, filmmaker, and poet Alan Sekula. The work's title is Ship of Fools, the Jockers Museum. Upon encountering Hasib's work, I had just written about the wind in relation to the Jockers Museum, a non-art collection of more than a thousand artifacts or objects of interest, that steadily grew in the last three years of Sekula's life from 2010 to 2013. Alongside Ship of Fools, a sequence of photographs made by the artist while traveling on board the activist ship The Global Mariner, the Dorcas Museum is part of Mukha's collection. Purchased through eBay or collected during his travels by the artist, the artifacts in this artist museum serve as reminders of social struggles in and around the docks, but in a larger sense, they also represent the very contradictions of the globalized world we live in. For this artist museum, Sekula also acquired several tabletop ventilators. He employed these vintage fans in the various exhibition settings to his last project with the intention of staging some sort of wind. My talk thus takes as a starting point not only a meeting of research or research interest, but also a meeting of winds as it were. This meeting or staging of winds present in both Sekula's and Mermaid's work and practice we somewhat re-articulate for this session. More specifically, at RIP, we carried out a wind tunnel test. The object to be tested, a vintage fan, actually the very exact same model that Sekula used in one of his stagings, was placed inside the wind tunnel in its test section. It was specifically purchased online for this inversion test as a kind of homage to Alan Sekula. We are showing you here short documentation of the test. The wind generated by the wind tunnel moves air around the unplugged vintage fan, which is held stationary. As its blades are being turned by the wind tunnel's powerful fan, the relation of the vintage fan is inverted. Its moving is bound up in the conditions of the wind tunnel, in a kind of performance of the fan. Before attending to the wind as animating agent, in different exhibition installments overseen by Sekula, I will very briefly situate the artist's last work and its space of reflection, that is, the interstitial space of harvest and docks, or in other words, the liminal space of the seaport. In so doing, I seek to relate to Rotterdam and its port, and more specifically, to Hasib Ahmed's wind tunnel and program at RIP. In this lecture, I will seek to explore a shared interest by both artists in tropes and their re-articulation, such as in the reverse of things as a way to rethink given categories. One of the tropes that I'm foregrounding, however, in the attempt to relate to the notion of the harbor or port in Sekula's and the wind tunnel in Hasib Ahmed's work concerns the metaphor of the threshold. To this end, I'm framing my talk with a passage by Walter Benjamin, taken from the Arcades Project. 
The threshold, Benjamin writes, must be distinguished from the boundary. A Schwelle threshold is a zone. Transformation, passage, wave action are in the word Schwellen, swell. Perhaps it is futile to reiterate the scale of Rotterdam's port as Europe's largest, not least as one of the largest in the world, figures varying. Rotterdam, Singapore, Hong Kong, Los Angeles. Sakula traveled extensively as part of his working methodology. He had traveled to Rotterdam repeatedly, critically engaging with its port in his investigation of maritime space. From the late 80s onwards, Sakula developed his study into maritime economies chronicling the effects of global capitalism on specific workplaces, ecosystems, and people as part of his itinerant research process. Al Sekula's magnum opus, Fish Story, a work of writing and photography, was shown in Rotterdam in the winter of 1995, in the exhibition format, that is, at the art center formerly known as Witte de Witt, and of which pictures taken by Sekula in the port of Rotterdam, but also in other locations, such as the Rotterdam Maritime Museum, feature in several of the sequences or chapters of Fist Story. While I will not speak about Fist Story, nor about the essay film The Forgotten Space, of which Sekula, together with Noel Birch, address Rotterdam, among other ports, I have nevertheless selected a couple of pictures of Fifth Story to relate to Rotterdam and its harbour in particular. Beyond the topographical concrete that Sekula guides us to, that is, as he calls it, the axis of locality of ports and ships and labour, we may understand the harbour and with it the docks as a liminal space that the artist associates to Sigmund Freud's notion of the uncanny, heimlich, unheimlich. The instance when something can be familiar yet strange at the same time, Freud suggested that unheimlich, in terms of something hidden or repressed, was to be read specifically in relation to heimlich, which may denote homely and familiar, but also secret and repressed and concealed. We may also associate the uncanny to two inventions that radically transformed dock labor and seafaring, and more so the whole port workings, cities and ocean-going vessels in the global supply chain of capitalism. The American invention of the standardized cargo container, which arrives in the mid-50s, the other invention also American, which globalized the labor market for seafaring some years prior to the arrival of the container, is the so-called flex of convenience registry. This invention of foreign registry breaks off the link between the ship's flag and its actual ownership. It does so, in essence, to avoid regulation. To be sure, both inventions are concerned with obscuring, hiding and concealing in an industry traditionally veiled in secrecy. In Ship of Fools, Sekula chronicles the activist voyage of the global mariner in words and images while traveling on it between 1998 to 2000. The ship's journey of circumnavigation, an exhibition campaign against the flag of convenience system, marked the 50th anniversary of an ongoing fight against the lowering of social standards provoked by the process of globalization. The voyage of the activist ship that you see here in front of Seattle's skyline just months before the WTO protest in late 1999 linked ports, people and oceans, calling at about 86 harbors across the globe. Rotterdam included. Sekula returned in 2010 to this past moment in conceiving of his project. 
There was a first articulation in the exhibition setting of Sekula's final project to carry with it a series of reflections and revisions for the artist's meteorological ideas to take shape. Indeed, as conversations and preparatory drawings attest, the artist tinkered with the idea of staging some sort of wind in the exhibition space. In doing so, he not only heightened the viewer's sensorium, but he also introduced some cardinal points of orientation. This was achieved, among others, via a so-called preface to the exhibition titled Wooden Ship Electric Fan and Flags of Convenience. The ensemble, first composed of a wide vintage fan, nine miniature flags representing nine flag of convenience registries, among them Pan Panama, Bahamas, Liberia, positioned as a group so as to point towards the schematic model of a container ship, was restaged in this manner at the Sao Paulo Biennale and Rio de Janeiro's Modern Art Museum. In Sao Paulo, the spatial disposition allowed for an outer approach to the harbor with the ship model, the fan, the flags, the wind, and an inner approach leading towards other objects displayed in the exhibition. At the San Francisco Art Institute, Sekula worked with large vitrines instead of plinth. To this end, he opted for a different fan and a distinct container ship model. One of the vitrines saw the artist's intention would contain the wind from within. Indeed, he considered the possibility of a new fan to be placed behind the ship and an old fan in its front so that the two winds would meet. Hence, the vitrine would include the weather, if but the metaphoric weather thus created. At Stills in Edinburgh, Sekula reverted to the use of a large white plinth and the handmade model ship as a framing device, while incorporating additional objects. It was only at La Criée in Rennes and at the Emily Carr University in Vancouver that further revisions were introduced for the flags to be for the first time displayed vertically, stirred by a black fan and thus literally blowing in the wind. Drawing a connection between Walter Benjamin's Angel of History and the ship going into the wind blowing from the past, Sekula alludes to Benjamin's famous description of Paul Klee's Angelus Novus painting. From this description I quote, But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. End quote. The wind was staged once more at Lumia City in Lisbon, yet without the wooden ship model and flags of convenience. Instead, the electric fan, actually the very same model that you saw in our inversion test, was to animate the sails or wings strangely evocative of Klee's painting. It was to animate another custom-made piece that entailed organic material, four slabs of preserved cod previously dried by air and wind, he placed one after the other and held by a wooden support. Yet the currents of air generated by the fan to animate the slabs of codfish had a second important function, to diffuse the fish's salty odor throughout the exhibition space. I have selected one further example for you, perhaps closest to Sekula's own performative exhibition grammar, his collecting a 1935 George Harriman comic snippet, Crazy Cat for the Dockers Museum. Set in a dreamlike place, the comic strip's persistent theme of love is structured in a triadic relationship. A dog who loves a cat who in turn loves a mouse. The structure of the strip is that of reversals. <laughs> 
The vengeful mouse, obsessive compulsively, throws a brick at the cat, who receives the hurt lovingly, misunderstanding the brick for a missile of love. In this particular sequence of the strip, which actually is an unusual setting, as the action normally takes place out of doors, Crazy Cat literally stages, articulates a breathe of wind from the inside. In so doing, the cat uses a tabletop ventilator directed towards the exterior while addressing the olfactory system. The windowsill may be read here in its own right as a threshold space, exposing the room to the meeting of air and winds. In other words, inside and outside seem to coalesce through this element of animation. Commonly praised for its innovative linguistics and trenchant humor, the strip attracted Sekula's attention. In fact, his private library in Los Angeles featured numerous books on and off Crazy Cat. In every sequence appearing from 1916 to 1944 in American newspapers, the brick is perceived in its movements through the air. Zip describes the sound of its passage. The brick becomes a missile tossed through the air. Think of Aeolian architecture or a fragment thereof here. Much of the cartoon's action we may thus consider to be airbound. So are the strip's gravity-defying speech and thought balloons, as one critic suggested. Placed mostly above the cartoon characters, these speech and thought balloons literally belong to the air. In other instances, the elements appear to merge with the annotated words and alliterations, just as speech and thought move along the medium of air. Or, put differently, communication draws its vectorial logic from the winds in terms of the through movement of language, as one example of the relation of words to wind. The key, perhaps, to these rather enigmatic passages is the movement of difference and deferral they articulate. What is more, in Crazy Cat's air logic, nature is reversed or inverted. So what air logic or logic of the air is revealed by our wind tunnel test at RIP? Thus, even when the wind tunnel comes closest to designating or denoting a threshold, in a sense, it stands through the elements that compose it. As a generator, it reproduces aspects of the atmosphere while bringing to mind those other spaces, previous wind tunnels staged by Hasiba Med and his collaborators, exposing the current one as variable from the first. Wind is motion, is movement. It acts upon objects, upon bodies. But also beyond this motion, this moving, it is indicative of how language fills a space, how it then parts as to leave room for other words. The wind generated in and by the wind tunnel is at least as sonorous as the air around it seems mute. It crosses through space at once bearing and interacting with all that it holds. In this sense, the wind tunnel instigates a speaking with beyond the object to be tested. At the same time, it alters while it speaks, activating. In turning now to the particles of air and the particularities of the wind tunnel adrip, I will briefly broach ideas about space and time via the notion of circulation not a circulation con that concerns the production and flow of goods via complex network relations of harbors that Sekula's work explored, but in terms of airflow. The air movement through the space and into the atmosphere, as this diagram shows. The walls of RIP 
as Hasib Ahmed annotates, and I quote here, contain the air that has moved from the city through the library of the winds and into the wind tunnel and out. It feeds this air back into the library of the wind to sustain the cycle against entropy. End quote. The Latin passes designates step, and the word pass describes a narrow path or corridor between walls. To pass is to be moving through or along something else in a temporal spatial sequence. Passages we may understand as movements in both time and space through, across, or past some kind of structure in which such movement may go through or which may itself be in motion. The artist's annotations address the through movement not only of air but also of language. The passage that a subject may come across before any trope that draws attention to it. During the first event of his program at RIP last February, Hasib Ahmed installed a curtain to RIP's entry door. A curtain in golden streaks restlessly moving. It visualized the storm that was blowing outside, naming her name. In fact, she was invited to enter. With the door kept open, Chiara, the atmospheric element, was neither beheld off nor kept in. At the same time, the golden foil curtain animated by Chiara enticed us to enter too. Restlessly, the curtain suspended any opposition between the alternatives of opening and closure. In this sense, a threshold zone was doubly indicative of an explicitly experiential space. Perhaps we can even speak of a liminal zone here, of a space of alteration. According to Walter Benjamin, a threshold does not necessarily designate a linear passage from one state to another nor does it connote a sharply outlined field. Rather, it designates a swell. Instead of it being a boundary that separates or divides, swell may be understood here as an intensification, a zone of experimental becoming. Swell, in this sense, is a threshold word in itself a word characterizing transitory, intermediate states, a word that opens to yet other words, to other meanings beside itself. What swell thus entails is that it doesn't keep to itself. It gives way to the words of others in an open-ended process of activation and insertion, though with different intensities. This is, at least, how I understand Hasib Ahmed's practice at large and program taming the horror vacui be operating. What struck me at Ahmed's first event held at RIP last February, called Inhaling the Storm, were further threshold words, or better, threshold letters, individual letters in the form of birthday balloons, air filled in contrast to the thought and speech balloons of the Crazy Cat comic strip. With a swelling contour, they spelled out the words Welcome, Chiara. The balloons were positioned on the floor as if scattered by the wind storm that drove them. They signaled words that pass, or perhaps they could be read as passwords in that they overtly pointed to a ceremonial, if not ritual, context. I'm alluding here to the collaboration between Antwerp-based artist Michel Martin and Hasib Ahmed. Yet beyond the evocation of the storm and the spelling out of its name, the letters seemed to float on a sea of bricks oscillating between dispersion and condensation. The threshold, Benjamin writes, and I end with his words, must be carefully distinguished from the boundary. A schwelle, threshold, is a zone. Transformation, passage, wave action are in the word schwellen, swell. 
Thank you very much.